news from the world over. Pope Francis said Tuesday he has thought about when it might be time to take leave of his flock. The message given during his homily at the Santa Marta Chapel is leading to speculation once again that he may be considering retiring from the papacy. Francis was reflecting on St. Paul's biblical discernment of when it was time to leave his flock in the care of others, a decision Francis said all bishops must make at some point. He said, quote, when I read this, I think about myself because I'm a bishop and I'll have to take my leave, end quote. Francis has said previously that Pope Benedict XVI opened a door to future popes to retire when he resigned in 2013. The 81-year-old Francis has said he didn't envision a long papacy for himself, but he hasn't said explicitly if he'd follow in Benedict's footsteps. Here with his analysis of this story and much more is the editor-in-chief of the CatholicThing.org and one-third of the papal posse, Robert Royal. Robert, thanks for being here. Let's start with these Chilean bishops meeting with the Pope this week, a massive scandal, a sex abuse scandal in Chile. Uh, this was really opened, though, when the Holy Father went there on a papal visit. That's what drew international attention to this story. Put it in some context for us. Why did this become the big story that it is now? Well, I think it's because Francis in interposed himself personally in what I think would have been better as a legal process. Mm. That it probably would have been better if he had allowed other people to make some decisions about who ought to be there. Apparently, all the bishops and the cardinals in Chile itself counseled him not to appoint this Bishop Barros, who was the point mm -hmm. of contention about, about the sexual abuse. Barros himself did not perpetrate any sexual abuse. Right. But he is said to have witnessed the sexual abuse by this father, Caradima, Caradima who is yeah. notorious, mm -hmm. has been thrown out by, by a church court, and I think is also facing uh, criminal charges he in is. Chile. Yeah. So the, the difficulty here is that the Holy Father stepped in, and for reasons that we're not clear about, insisted that this Bishop Barros become the ordinary of a small town called Osorno in Chile. Now, the Chilean people as a whole were very upset about this. Mm. The, the uh, victims of the sexual abuse warned him not to do this. Others did it as well. And yet, for some reason, he pushed ahead. Mm. Now, a after it was revealed, he had to send uh, a delegation to go and study the situation. They right. wrote a 2,300-page report. And when he came back, he realized he'd made a big mistake. He'd been ra rather sharp with the people who were pushing him not to appoint this Bishop right. Barros, um, saying that you need evidence. He said, put it in your right. mind. You need, you need evidence. Right. And you calumny, know, calumny. It's calumny he pointed to at do them, this. Yeah. So he made a big mistake, and someone clearly led him astray because he isn't going to be following every detail in a country like Chile. Right. So bringing those bishops to uh, Rome is a good thing, but the situation was exacerbated by his, his intervening personally uh, in th this yeah. very complicated situation. Well, this week, well, it, first in a letter that he sent to all the Chilean bishops inviting them to come to Rome, he said, look, I was part of the problem. I caused this, and I apologize to you. Now, some are saying, look at that. Look at the act of humility there. Uh, when was the last time you heard a pope say this? Your reaction? Well, I think that that was all to the good. He, he made a mistake, he recognized it, and he acknowledged it. Mm -hmm. However, the, the important thing, as some of the victims have been saying, is we must go on further from this point. It's not enough just to talk about sin mm -hmm. and forgiveness and uh, getting over the hurts of the, the past. There needs to be a real accounting. Mm -hmm. Now, we know from the past that the Pope has not been reticent when it comes to getting rid of people in various Vatican offices, sometimes yeah. for his trivial reasons as they may have criticized him privately. We know that that happened in the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Yeah. Um, he's been much more reluctant in terms of getting rid of higher-ups that are closer to him. For example, uh, Monsignor uh, Vigano, who was involved in what we've been calling Lettergate, which is an attempt to make a letter from uh, Pope Emeritus Benedict looked as if it was supporting the Pope when in fact it wasn't. Mm -hmm. He remains basically in place despite a huge mm -hmm. scandal. And, and yeah. to be the head of a communications office yeah. after being caught trying to spin something that way is... Chastising pretty... the world for <laughs> fake right. news as you're <laughs> perpetrating it. Yeah, that's a little bit of a problem. And I, I think that, that similarly in this case, there has to be an accounting. Okay, the Pope has said he did not have complete and well-balanced information about right. that situation in Chile. Okay, now we must proceed to the next step. Who in his 
counselor sure. among his his counselors, the people mm -hmm. he goes to for information like this, who misled him? Were they misled themselves? At some point, though, the chain of responsibility has to come to an end, and we have to find who is responsible for trying to cover up something. He clearly was very much convinced that Bishop Barros was innocent, and he didn't want an a innocent man to be punished. Right. So who, who convinced him that he should mm. take on what was basically the entire popular sentiment in a country like Chile. Yeah. Well, you mentioned, and his own bishops, many of the bishops said, uh, don't, no, do don't, do don't do this, don't do this. And yet he went ahead and did so. One of the victims whom we interviewed several weeks ago, uh, Juan Carlos Cruz, uh, talked about the difficulty of embracing the entire narrative because he knew for a fact his testimony had gotten to the Pope. And he talked about it this way, watch. Through Marie Collins and, and Cardinal O'Malley, we managed to get this letter in the hands of the Pope in 2015. And I detailed all the horrible things that Barros, um, on top of the others, but focusing on Barros right now, mm -hmm. um, that he witnessed how Karadima abused us, abused us to hear him Talk about a, 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 a to talk about us that way, calling us slanderers. Um, it was terrible because it it set the clock back for so many uh, victims. Now the pope the pope has met with these survivors, including Juan Carlos Cruz, whom you saw there. Um, they felt so relieved after that meeting. They felt they understood a bit more. I think. And uh, we tried to interview some of the victims this week. They said, no, we want the Pope to have his say. This is his moment. What does that mean, the Pope taking the time to meet with these victims, and where do things proceed from here? Well, this is what I'm trying to get at. It's good to have that personal involvement in terms of the hurts uh, of the crimes that were committed, to, to recognize that the head of the, the Roman Catholic Church uh, agrees that you've suffered a wrong, and he's about to right it. Right. But how does that happen? How does that happen? And um, we've got, I think, 33, 34 bishops who all, uh, that we are told, advised him, including two cardinals. Um, cardinal Erasures, who is the former cardinal archbishop of Santiago in Chile, right. um, is, uh, is part of the Council of Nine, a very mm -hmm. close-held sort of kitchen cabinet of the Holy Father. Yeah. And then the current cardinal archbishop, um, uh, 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 Cardinal Arch Archbishop Ezzati, his name is. Mm -hmm. Also, they both claim that they, they warned the Holy Father not to appoint Barros as, as a bishop. Mm -hmm. So some of the people who are very close in with him um, have responsibilities toward their own bishops back in, in Chile. Someone somewhere along the way, and this has to be discovered. If we don't go back and, and mm -hmm. find out the exact person's or, or person or persons who handed, who handed along this, this bad along information, this because we know that the Cardinal O'Malley from Boston handed the, the Holy Father a letter, that letter, yeah. several years ago. Mm -hmm. um, either he read it himself and forgot about it, or didn't read it and handed it to someone. There, there's some breakdown here, and, and what has to happen is the structures for dealing with this have to be reviewed very, very carefully, and, and it has to be made sure that this will never happen again. Mm -hmm. uh, when the Pope began this pontificate, he said there would be zero tolerance for sexual abuse. He's come under a lot of criticism, certainly in the secular world, but in the Catholic world as well, for his handling of these situations, because he, again, as we see throughout his pontificate, mercy is, is in the forefront, and he focuses on the individual. And to the world right now, in the environment in which we live, when you have a perpetrator like this who's abusing children, it's very hard for us to muster compassion for a perpetrator who remains in office with all the trappings of their office. Where does his pontificate go from here, and how does he rebuild that trust? Yeah, that's a very good question, and it's a hard question, because they, as we know, the, these sexual abuse cases are difficult to deal with, uh, to begin with. Back in the old days, right. what the church used to do was, they used to regard this as sin, you know, there would be mm -hmm. repentance. And it was a would, private matter. Was, they and, shuffled it away, it which kinda, is part of the problem. Right. And then, of, of course, now we know that it's a much deeper psychological orientation, and it, it's criminality, and that has to be all dealt with. Mm -hmm. I think unless we see some heads roll here, and we can put this very frankly, yeah. Uh, I don't know how he rebuilds credibility because um, even if some of the bishops who were involved did not themselves, as like Barros, not we were not perpetrators, mm -hmm. they enabled or hid uh, abuse of minors, which in itself, I imagine, in Chile as here in the United States, is a crime. If you know about a crime like this, I mean, it has to be 
reported to the authorities. Mm -hmm. Some of the bishops in, in Chile, some of the cardinals have said that they did, when these, these um, uh, victims came forward, that they did report these things um, to the proper civil authorities. Mm -hmm. There's a new case that's come out now about the Marist brothers yep. in, in Chile and elsewhere that, that mm -hmm. seems to be part of this same um, complex situation in Chile. But unless we see that somebody is held accountable, you may recall that Cardinal Law, who was a wonderful mm -hmm. cardinal, he was very helpful in, on a lot of fronts here in the United States, yeah. but covered up some awful things that happened yep. in the Archdiocese of Boston, it was eventually removed mm -hmm. to Rome where he essentially was yep. kept out of the reach of the law right. and never was held accountable for some of the things that he did. So yep. I think that has to happen. Otherwise, it's just talk. Mm -hmm. Well, in Chile, this situation is different from uh, from Ireland or the United States in that you're dealing with not only the sin and the and the, the you know the, the abuse, it's power and the corruption woven in. That is problematic. And if that gets shuffled away, I, I don't know how you remake this. At the Mass on Tuesday, at his private Mass with these bishops from Chile, the Holy Father focused on St. Paul's Gospel or St. Paul's letters, and he mentioned that all the bishops, including the Pope, should seek the grace to be able to take our leave and step down. Now, some saw this as him musing on a possible retirement. I see it more as a coming purge in Chile. Yeah, that's the way I read it initially too. Like he also talks about himself, of course, mm -hmm. and, and how they, it's it's a way of kind of saying, yeah, we're all, we're all at some to, point we're all bishops. We're all bishops, and at some point we're going to have mm -hmm. to withdraw. But see, I think that the difficulty here is, it's not just a matter of bishops stepping down. It's a matter of if you are are implicated in what is clearly a crime against minors. Mm -hmm. Do you then face civil penalties, criminal penalties? So the complexity there is going to be who's willing to take the risk of not only going into a penitential situation within right. the church, but perhaps facing uh, the police in Chile. Well, this is the big question mark in the United States context as well. You know, do you face criminal penalties in the civil sphere? I think you should. Yeah, I, I think too. you should. You're a citizen of the country that you occupy, and as a Catholic, your obligation is to your church, your God, and to your country to abide by those laws. And I, I think uh, hiding behind the skirts of the church to hide from, from justice, it, it's a bad thing. Let's talk about intercommunion. This is a big issue. Uh, the Pope had a meeting with German bishops, but this is something, Robert, that will affect the entire church. Should the bishops of Germany, who in a majority voted, to allow intercommunion so that if a Catholic is married to a Protestant spouse, if they believe in the Eucharist, they can come forward and receive, even though they are not a member of the communion, haven't been baptized. Your thoughts on this and where we are now? Yeah, in an odd way, I think that there's a, there's a connection a, here. There's a connection between these two, and it's the wrong connection. <laughs> that, 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 it seems to me that the Pope should personally intervene in doctrinal matters and that in these jurisdictional matters, there should be structures. You know, there are canon law courts, and, and you know, people are held responsible, and people like Father Karadima were, were expelled right. from, the, from the priesthood. Mm -hmm. And he should allow those processes to go forward. There's a reason why we have those structures. That's because you can present evidence, uh, people can weigh it, mm -hmm. you can see what the counter evidence is, right. and then a, a, determ a rational determination can be made. In the case of the intercommunion, I think that we're, if not, in schism, we're very close to a, a, a schism because mm. we've got, I'm joking about this these days, but we used to say that you, how are we going to have a universal church if in Poland you can't receive communion and in Germany it's great mercy to receive communion. <laughs> right. Now we've got a division within Germany. Okay. You know, we've got some, some bishops and cardinals who, who think it's utterly impossible, including the former head of the, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, Gerhard Mueller, who you've interviewed. Right. Who said, wait, I'll quote him. He said, the statement from the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith was very poor, and it contained no answer to the central, essential question. It is not possible to be in sacramental communion without being in ecclesial communion, he said. And basically, the Pope and the CDF have opened the door and said, well, let the German bishops figure it out in a spirit of, uh, I'll put, ecclesial communion and come to a unanimous result. What does that mean? It'll never happen. It, it, there already is a division there, and it goes very deep because it, it involves how people think about the nature of the church. Now, that said... Mm -hmm. The document that the German bishops initially put out had a number of qualifications. And there was language like oh, you, you, you essentially accept 
the yeah. Catholic nature of the church and, you know, one thing and another. Yeah. But as we know, in practical terms, yeah, come on. this is simply going to mean that, of you course. know, I'm going to, to, to uh, receive communion and my wife, who's a Protestant, is going to go up with me. And, That's and, exactly and it's, right. It's already happening, but, you know, it's, it's... Do you see this connected to what we've been talking about for so many years, Amoris Laetitia and that that uh, exhortation coming out of the two synods. Is this related where you create merciful loopholes that people begin to march through and create a precedent that then takes over in practice all over the church, even though doctrinally you haven't changed anything? Right. Well, I mean, it's very clear that you, once you start a process, and the Pope likes starting processes. He doesn't like to have to you know, make decisions and cut off mm -hmm. debate. He likes to let a debate go forward. But in this particular case, I mean, we're touching, t t touching on the Eucharist, which is the body and blood of our Lord, and it's a sacrament in which we are united to him, that his church becomes united with him in the mystical body of Christ. That's kind of central. This, to this is, is, is quite central. And, and once you start de you know, debating whether it's this or whether it's that, you start to get some strange uh, developments. The president of Germany at a, at a Catholic conference said the other day, well, I, I don't see the point of this debate over this wafer the Catholics should simply share that wafer with the Protestants. Climate change is a much more serious issue. Well, you know, maybe for it is for a secular uh, political figure, yeah. but for Catholics, uh, climate changes, and there may be some climate problems down the line, and we want to be yeah, I'm watching climate change here this but afternoon. It rained. As people say, you're dead a long time, and so yeah. your 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 connection <laughs> to God, your your relationship with the Lord, is ultimately going to be a much bigger question than this or that you know, climate mm -hmm. uh, policy. Mm -hmm. well, well, uh, final question. Uh, there is a lot of talk, this being the 50th anniversary of Humanae Vitae, um, Paul VI, landmark encyclical, which, among other things, laid out a vision for marriage, family life, a procreative union, that it seems people now, theologians and voices in Rome, are looking to crack open and re-examine where do you think this is leading or tending at this point? Well, I think it's very clear. The same type of discernment of, of special cases, I think, is, well, let's not say it's going to happen, but it looks like that's the direction mm -hmm. that the reconsideration of Humanae Vitae is going to, going to take. Mm -hmm. um, some of the people who write at the Catholic thing uh, ha have put this very strongly, and they say it's not exactly like we haven't reconsidered Juan Evita in the past, John Paul II could be considered right. it multiple times, Benedict, Benedict XVI, and many other people have, and they come down exactly where the entire Catholic tradition comes down, that you can't have artificial contraception. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just not morally licit. Mm -hmm. But there seems to be a, a more generalized uh, approach to all these neuralgic moral questions that, hey, you know, each individual mm -hmm. case is different. Yeah, we're not touching the doctrine, but in... In point of fact, in, in practical you activity, you don't have to touch the doctrine right. because you're, you're just going past it in, in these particular cases. I've been saying this for years. If you change the practice, it doesn't matter what you have on paper. The lived doctrine is something other than what you state or what you claim to defend. And that's what Amoris Laetitia was about. That's what this intercommunion debate is about. And I think, sadly, that's what this Humanae Vitae tug of war to come will be about. Robert Royal. We'll keep watching it together. Thank you for being here. You can follow Robert Royal's insightful commentary at thecatholicthing.org.